Thank you all for being here. It's so great to see such a nice crowd. My name is Samara Chadwick. I'm the programmer of um, the VRRV Exchange, which is an exchange between German and Canadian uh, creators in VR. It's bringing together people from all different disciplines. Um, we have VR producers and creators. We have programmers. We have also artists and theorists um, that are kind of at the center of each team, and we're, we've been um, prototyping works. We spent a week together in Montreal two weeks ago at, a, at the Mutech um, Digital Arts Festival. We're now here at Republica infusing the projects with the new ideas that are kind of emerging around the different rooms today. Um, we're also engaging in a series of different conferences. We had some in Montreal and these are um, a series that we're having here today. We had some yesterday. Um, this panel is going to be followed by another one called Visualizing the Invisible. I encourage you to stay. It's about the intersection of VR and journalism. This panel is um, called Stories We Tell. Um, it's a discussion about um, representation in VR, voices in VR. We're going to see where it's headed. The idea kind of behind the panel was this idea that technologies inherently are infused with the ideologies of the people who code them. Um, and this is something that's kind of really important to acknowledge, especially now in VR, as VR is a nascent technology, it's still being formed, and so um, we kind of want to develop a new language for engaging with the technology so that we can kind of um, circumvent certain structures of power that are already starting to impose themselves within the space of virtual reality. Um, and so the idea now at Republica and at future conferences to really continue to have these conversations with diverse voices, with people who are challenging the structures of power, trying to understand the ideologies that are kind of almost absent-mindedly infused into how we relate to the medium, how we tell stories, how we engage with one another, how we engage with reality and virtual reality. So this is what the panel is about. We're going to, each of the panelists are going to introduce themselves. There'll be about half an hour of discussion. And then we really invite you as an audience to join the conversation. If you have a question, please raise your hand um, and we'll, we'll incorporate you into the debate. Um, so I'd love to introduce Tali Goldstein. She's the um, moderator of the panel. She runs a studio at Concordia University called Casarara. She's a VR producer. She's embedded in one of the teams at the VRRV project. Thanks so much for being here, Tali. Hey guys, I'm Tali Goldstein, a uh, German name, uh, Brazilian raised and Canadian right now. So talking about my background, also have helped uh, the discussions on decolonization of the VR medium. Uh, we want to provoke the others to talk about uh, POVs in VR and as well who are the protagonists of the creation and uh, for whom we are making uh, VR products right now. So. So uh, my background is uh, originally on film. I've been working on VR since 2013, um, doing experimental artistic VR and as well commercial VR. I uh, have also a lot of experience in museology and curation for uh, media, uh, new emergent media. And uh, we'll bring all of this uh, to the discussion with the others uh, for now on. I wanted to ask everybody to introduce themselves and uh, start with as a VR creator or thinker, what is your beef with VR right now? Should I get started? Uh, hi, my name is Chris Culver. Um, I'm, uh, I've been working as a senior editor at Wired Germany for the past three years. And before that, I was uh, founder and um, editor-in-chief of Missy magazine, a uh, feminist magazine on politics and pop culture based here in Berlin. Um, the, a print publication. Uh, I'm probably the person on the panel who comes least from a VR background. So uh, I, I follow projects and I'm, uh, I'm a consumer, so to speak, but I'm not a creator myself. Um, I think the perspective that I'm, I can bring into the discussion uh, is about uh, storytelling and diversif uh, diversity in storytelling because what we tried to achieve um, with Missy Magazine was to to shift the perspective and, and have a publication where women as uh, creative people or creators are, are um, 
put into the focus. So uh, it was about feminist discussions, but it was mostly also about women as creative people and uh, different perspective uh, to find a different perspective from which we tell, tell stories about the human experience. So that's what I'm going to try to bring into the discussion today. Hi, I'm Etienne Turpin. Uh, I'm the founding director of Anexact Office, which is a design practice based here in Berlin and in Jakarta, Indonesia. And what we try to look at is the interface between technological and aesthetic uh, practices. And so over the past six years, uh, we've developed a number of open source software platforms for humanitarian response, environmental monitoring, and different kinds of training. Um, and, and pedagogical applications, uh, both on our own uh, with the national infrastructure laboratories and with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge in the US. And so I am also a consumer, but someone who um, in my practice in, in software development and production is increasingly seeing um, a push towards more VR applications coming from a number of different uh, trajectories in the open source and humanitarian sector. And so hopefully I can um, you know, discuss that and, and bring a, a question of some of the applications that are maybe outside the current uh, normative uh, house of VR. Hi guys, I'm Nile Nukshuk and I'm a producer of VR 360 film content based out of Toronto. And uh, I've been working in VR 360 since about 2014, um, and I make experiential content. Also, um, because of my background in film, I do a lot of like cinematic narrative content, so documentary or scripted narrative. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm really fascinated about talking about today, um, and one of kind of the issues that I have with VR as it stands, is representation in VR, especially as uh, a medium that is so immersive um, and unlike traditional uh, forms of, uh, of content like television and, and film, where you're kind of just a passive um, viewer of content. With VR, you know, you're really having to ask yourself, who am I in? this space and where am I and kind of discussing how that um, you know uh, who's making the content and um, whose perspective we're sharing affects um, affects the medium I just realized me and Etienne forgot to uh, to mention our uh, problem with VR right oh, yeah. So should I still add to that? Okay. So I think for me, the most problematic aspect probably is exclusion by price and by technology. So if I think about who even gets to participate in these uh, or experience these experiences, obviously it's going to be you know who who has access to a headset. They are still, even though we have seen a couple of lower price applications, but a lot of the stuff is quite uh, expensive. So that is a level of exclusion that. Um, by price, and even before that, there's another level of exclusion by who is even getting started to be interested in that. So, if we're going to talk about, you know, what are the experiences that that we can even have in VR, this uh, I'm asking myself who even gets to have those. Um, I guess uh, I don't know. My 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 beef question, I suppose, is is similar both in terms of who gets to produce the content, but also. Um, the alibis that are given to that content. So how we're going to improve society or create empathy or create all of these things, which in a way are, are laden over some of those forms of exclusion as their, as their alibi. And, um, and I, I'd like to address that in terms, of, in terms of labor, but also in terms of um, uh, physical rehabilitation projects that we've been working in partnership with as well. Okay, so I think we should start exactly talking about language and the fact that we do not have rules in a language that is very established in VR right now. Being a mix, uh, many people uh, have been uh, talking about VR being a hybrid between uh, uh, simulation and cinema and theater and gamification. And I wanted to ask you guys, in that sense, who you think we are making VR for? Uh, who are the people that have access 
to that technology, just uh, jumping uh, a little bit more in depth on uh, what you started mentioning, Chris. And uh, after that, how uh, we are catering, again, our content to this very specialized and very abled and very rich uh, consumer base. Okay, that was a lot. Which one should we start on? I think that there is um, this idea that it's, uh, you know, VR can mean, uh, there's just like so much, um, and you've seen here that VR can mean so much, and uh, what you can do with it is so varied that, you know, some people are using it as a, a mode for tourism or um, uh, ecotourism and um, medicine and health and training and and entertainment and and um, so it's it's kind of a hard one to define because that that kind of mixture of what exactly VR is can can be so different based on each experience. But that means that this language that's um, that's being created and it really is being created because this is an entirely new platform is something that's that's kind of in the process of evolving and it's one of these things that you know um, is if you're kind of merging cinema and and video games there's different kind of roles within that um, workflow and also just language that's used that you kind of it's some time sometimes there's overlap sometimes you need new words and um, I think that when we're talking about um, these issues that about representation and and all of that stuff it's kind of perfect to address these now because the the language that you, we use really is going to affect the the kind of the way that we're making content. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a question of language, but I want to maybe go to the second part of your uh, your question and uh, look, who are we creating this for? Because um, I think if we look at, I think Samara just pulled up a slide of uh, Statista before, of who even owns VR headsets. So I think on the most simple level, we um, we know that. Uh, considerably fewer women even own the equipment. So if we're going to talk about who is it for, just on a very basic level right now, the reality is that we are mostly creating for males, probably white males. I mean, that doesn't mean that this has to... Uh, it's just on the descriptive level, normatively, we don't have to approve of that or think that's a great uh, situation, but that's a situation just by, you know, the, the distribution of equipment. So... Um, maybe one of the, if you want to talk about accessibility, one of the ideas would be how do we even get other people interested in that, maybe on a, on a level, and then how do we, how do we maybe distribute equipment in a way where it's, it's more accessible. Um, yeah, that's what comes to my mind. I think I'm very interested in knowing how much are we catering our experience towards these people. I can talk on my own experience when we are making games. I make games uh, nowadays. Uh, when we are making games for a demographic that's uh, 18 to 35 white male, uh, sometimes I think we get less daring. Uh, sometimes we know what works for that demographic. So if our interest is to sell that product to help the ecosystem of VR become more commercially, uh, commercially stable, we end up catering our experiences exactly to that. And how is uh, how much of our responsibility as content creators are we leaving behind uh, by doing so? And how us as producers can break away from that when we still need to create things that will be distributed and consumed. It's still a product, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would just add that, one, I mean, coming from a, a software production uh, uh, point of view, one of the questions that we try to never ask is who are we making this for? We want to ask who are we making this with and why are we making it with these people? Um, and so we really try to use a kind of co-research approach to the development of the, those platforms, and that involves quite an extensive ethnographic relationship. Um, but, but about the demographic question, I would point to another non-VR but very interesting and in, important platform, which was developed by Janice Dickinson at, at the Cornell Lab for Ornithology, which is the largest participatory 
uh, environmental program in the world of, of bird monitoring. And by understanding how different demographics who logged into those platforms were particularly led to certain kinds of environments and user experiences, they were able to then work with other designers to diversify the types of platform experience and therefore expand to a much wider reach of participation by paying attention to who they were building it with. And so I think, and Janice's work is, is in incredibly important from um, uh, human AI ID um, space and how do we create um, interaction design that doesn't, that isn't exclusionary on the basis of assumptions, right? That, that are, that many of us are blind to, especially dudes who make software. Mm -hmm. I think, um, so, so this is one of the potential interfaces of the the project is eBird, and so there are any number of ways that you can participate in this. This is multi-million daily user projects, but they all have a kind of different UI experience for different demographics, which they themselves have studied very closely. And, and so I think that coming to the game question, it's it's a it's a similar way of using that demographic participation to then step back and say, well, what? Who's not interested? Who and are why? we missing? And here? who are we missing? And why are these people not wanting to work with us in this space? Do you know uh, how big was the population where it was tested with? Like how many people? What's the sample? Um, no, I mean the the initial. Um, uh, or, uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab project had one data scientist and, and about 40 ecologists, and now it's kind of reverse um, because they have such a high degree of participation. But really, um, all of the various interfaces of participation were built out of ethnographic work with communities that were specifically excluded from the other possible ways of participating. And, and, and I mean, Janice's work is on, on human computation paradigm in this regard is really an important touchstone, I think. Um, kind of the same, going along the same vein of like, what, it, what, who is this made for? One thing that I kind of experience a lot in Canada, at least, and as an indigenous person of Canada, is um, that we're uh, often in certain types of VR, in uh, this kind of VR that's coined as empathy VR, um, that there is a lot of people that look like me being represented in these empathy pieces, kind of as a, as, you know, a marginalized group that might not, um, that, you know, um, is, we're kind of using, um, you know, indigenous people or people in refugee camps, things like that, that are essentially um, to kind of create this, uh, as Chris Milk said, this uh, empathy machine, this idea that through VR we can help understand each other better by placing our, like, placing um, a viewer in the experience of someone that is experiencing, um, in most of the cases, like, less than. Um, and that's something that I, you know, have a lot of um, issues with, but even just, even with myself um, making VR games, it's something that, you know, people from my community barely can access internet. Um, you know, they can barely access free, uh, clean water, but, but the, the idea of getting uh, internet and, let, and then on top of that access to technologies and being able to, um, you know, consume even 360 degree content, um, it's, you know, it's difficult. And so what I find is a lot of the time we're making these, you know, in cities like I live in, in Toronto, you know, where we can set up these, um, uh, like clouds over Sidra, which is great, um, but Chris Mill kind of created that term, um, uh, empathy machine, uh, where we can, you know, pay a lot of money to get into spaces and be in these swivel chairs wearing a thousand dollar headset and kind of um, it, people kind of assuming that, you know, oh, we're going to know what it's like to be in a refugee camp or know what it's like to be in a community that's gone through a suicide epidemic. Um, and, and, and so when it's a question of, you know, what is this, who is this created for? It's really created for non-Indigenous audiences um, or non-Syrian uh, um, 
uh, you know, viewers. And and one part that that for me I struggle with is is the issue of representation, and that you know these are not people that are. Um, representing themselves in these works. These are outsiders kind of coming in and creating this perspective. So um, kind of having you kind of feel as if you're in that space, but even the creators are not from that space themselves. And that kind of great, creates this, like, this weird perception of what life is like. Because of course, when you're living it, you're not thinking about it as this, you know, this horrible situation or this, um, it, it's, this is just your life. And there's also moments of levity and brightness within that. And I think that's uh, something that's lost within um, within that process. And I think that when we're talking about um, and, and you know when it's come, same with uh, women, although it's you don't see like these empathy pieces about what it's like to be women um, as much. Although there are, yeah, there's like walking down the street while being a woman, and you're kind of like experiencing what it's like being catcalled or something. But yeah, so I mean, there 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 are those. Um, but it's. Uh, it's yeah. It's just kind of um, really fascinating how you know um, th how we need to kind of have this conversation about who's making who's making the content and you know for whom. Um, and there's uh, we talk a lot about innovation and and people want innovation and and you had mentioned you know that by kind of um, making content for the 18 to 35 white males is you're kind of making the same kind of thing over and over again. And what I feel like a lot of um, a lot of what we do is put into kind of commercial and traditional drive models, um, and we're kind of losing that support of the grassroots communities that are really kind of building the infrastructure for minority voices to be creating content and learning the skills to be able to learn to create content. Um, and that's you know like organization. Like I'm a part of like Dames Making Games, which is about you know training um, female coders and developers and programmers, um, so that they can be able to. And I, I do code clubs up in, in Nunavut where we teach Inuit kids how to create uh, video games. So they can see themselves represented, um, and I think that's you know a big part of the process. Can I just uh, quickly say something to that? Because I think it's really interested, uh, interesting the the dilemma that you mentioned with the um, from the journalistic perspective as a journalist. For me, um, my or as a reporter, my job is to you know make readers or uh, the consumers of that journalism to take them into space and let them experience. An environment or context, a space where otherwise they wouldn't have access. For instance, a refugee camp. So obviously, VR for journalists offers a whole new, uh, so many new opportunities to to have uh, consumers experience that differently in an interactive matter. Because yes, I can you know through text describe what you know this camp would look like, what the smells are, what it sounds like, talk to the people, take them there take them into the story but to be in that space is going to be a different immersive experience for the person but then as you mentioned the problem comes up what is like what is my perspective coming into that camp even if i spend as a journalist spend three weeks in that camp i'm going to have a very different and really limited perspective compared to the people who are there and they don't have the means of production to tell their own story so for me the question uh, every time this dilemma comes up i try to ask myself um, who pr who profits in what ways from me t going there and telling this story is it going to be something that you know is it going to be me because I'm going to be the awesome journalist who's <laughs> going to win a prize or going to have her name put underneath that story and I went into the camp? Or just as an example, I didn't report from refugee camps, just to be clear. Not that one, not in Syria. But um, yeah, but you know what I mean. Or is it do the people that I tell the story about are going to profit in any kind of way? I wanted to interject and just ask if the journalist in that case doesn't work like a curator or an editor of the story they are telling. Because if you come there with the means of production is not somehow the opportunity or the, obliga the, the ethical obligation of giving that protagonism away to people that are actually living that reality. And that's where I find that many of uh, good experiences that I saw with journalism and VR are when uh, 
the journalist or the researcher is able to put their ego away and give away the means of production for that established amount of time to come out with something a little bit more authentic, where the crop and the discourse is no longer the journalist, but the journalist acts more like a medium or a facilitator of uh, creation or distribution or means of production. So. I, I leave that there for the journalists. Uh, are you giving it away uh, enough to make sure that other voices are being heard? And I think that it's also, um, we have to, while there's journalists doing this work, um, what I'm referring to a lot is um, there are a lot of just uh, companies that are built on making these empathy pieces where that's kind of their, that's their job. And so it's, and I've, I've certainly come across a lot of people and been on panels with, uh, with, you know, friends of mine who kind of get into this idea of like, oh, a couple communities away, there was this suicide epidemic when I was filming. So I had to go there. And, and it's like, well, did you though? And did you have to go there right that week? And and did you ha have to go on your own without kind of consultation? And it's so it's like those kind of questions that I think um, a good journalist will actually think about when they're when they're going into that, which I think is is the the, the difference I, uh, between kind of like good journalism and bad journalism. Yeah, I, I, w I would just say that I think I think from many of the the these projects and in the, in the way that of trying to get a kind of hit, of trying to get a, look, we made people care about Syria, or look, we made people care about white supremacy, or whatever liberal version of those things, is, is that, that the emphasis then immediately shifts to how, how well made is that experience, to the sort of um, creativity of the firm, rather than to the relation of vulnerability that could be created with enabling those stories to be told. And I think that that's, we have to understand that structure of rewarding that creativity as part of the same structure of white supremacy that creates that inequality in the first place. And, and so how, that, how those technologies are valorized needs to also be critiqued. And I, and I think that, that that question of how I can represent someone's empathy for them as a way of showing my designer prowess is, is a really problematic thing, but that is repeated endlessly from MIT to the national labs to any of these other startups that we see. And I, and I think there is a limit to empathy that can be created in VR, which is something that I don't know if lots of people recognize. So it's this idea that, and, and people say it all the time, like it's this like, kind of like tired like um, idea of you know placing someone else in someone else's shoes like it's just it sounds very nice but the world is built up in more than just one experience and it's like every experience if I'm coming into it is going to be different than yours if you're kind of experiencing it and it will be the same experience but we've got you know a lifetime of experiences that kind of frame our perception of this this one so it's um, and so that's what we have to recognize and that, that you know, you, you, by kind of like um, being in an air conditioned space in a comfy seat and watching um, like being in the perspective of a homeless person is not going to make you know what it's like to be homeless. And it's, you know, um, walking around and um, uh, looking down and, and is seeing dark skin is not going to, you know, you're not going to know what it's like to be a black person if you're white. Um, and, and sometimes I think that, that that's not clarified in, in when people are kind of talking about VR because VR is really cool and it's really exciting and you can do a lot of really great immersive things. And so it's it kind of, you know, can sometimes um, people that are in it and making it can kind of romanticize it a bit and be like, yes, we can, um, you know, make you feel as if you're another, another race or, um, you know, it, 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 having a totally different life experience. 
think it really ties to a provocation. I think uh, immersive VR can be, and very interactive VR can be very good provoking uh, discussions about uh, embodiment, disembodiment, uh, having another type uh, of body, having another ethnicity, having another context. I think it's very contextual. And uh, I think uh, when we think, we, 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 a lot of wishful thinking when we imagine that one piece, I, I, I totally agree with you, when one piece is going to uh, make up the mind or uh, alone uh, shape uh, ideology, shape awakening, uh, I think that's a very, very naive of producers and uh, creators. And uh, I also think it's a power trip, thinking we have a new toy, let's make this empathy uh, like machine and make people think like us and create a little echo chamber inside the VR simulation space. But uh, there are some experiences, and I was talking about that with Chris, I we want her to talk a little bit more about that, uh, that can really bring a rupture in the way that you perceive uh, the context that you are right now. And uh, I wanted to talk more about that environment, uh, that female fluid body. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think that's a very good example of how we can start discussions through VR. Um, yeah, I think the, that I like that you mentioned embodiment because I think that's really what makes a difference. Of um, There's a lot of gamified experiences where game makers, uh, a lot of indie game makers are trying to create what um, you maybe just mentioned, kind of like the experience of what it is uh, like to be sans papier, um, trying to make it on the streets of Paris or trying to get into the European Union and all that. And I do think that it is really, it can be a really great vehicle for storytelling because yes, if I'm not gonna, you know, if that's not my reality, it's gonna tell me, it can be a good way to learn about uh, how hard it is to to um, if uh, to make it from day to day if you don't have legal papers, for instance. So I don't want to I don't want to bash those experiences, but I think the the added value or what really makes lifts VR to another level is the embodiment that you're not just gonna go through the steps of of that experience, but you're actually gonna have the point you have the point of view of um, you feel like you're in in that body. And we know from, I think, the studies um, on empathy that that people say uh, there's experiences, you know, where, um, for instance, as a male, you get to experience what it's a gender swap, but you're in a female body. So even though you don't have the tactile experience of touching your body, maybe you still get to, yeah, there we have it, get to um, look down and kind of see you know, see boobs or have a female body if you're a man or the other way around. And I do think that, uh, for, I mean, for me, that was a really interesting experience that can also maybe for us as, as cis people or not trans people um, maybe uh, give us even an idea of what a trans person feels like, um, to, what it feels like to have a dis uh, mismatch between you know the the gender that you are and the body that you're kind of traveling in in this world. But at the same time, um, this experience hasn't been created by trans people. So then again, we get into the problem of who's making this or what. You know, it's like me as a cis person can say, "Oh wow, that was such an amazing experience for me to you know have that mismatch." Whereas for other people, it's just their their reality. And for me, it's just going to be a very short, privileged uh, excursion into what that irritation would be like. And the same uh, same applies to um, VR experiences that where um, uh, you know, you're looking into a, a mirror and maybe um, even though you're white, you know, you're in the body of a black person. And then we have studies that show that after that, people have more empathy towards black people. But then again, that is also implying that I'm a white user uh, having that experience for a black person who's using that experience. It's just, you know, a black person is looking back at yourself. That's kind of the, the experience you have every day when you look into the mirror. So, um, yeah. I'm going to bring something else, another provocation here. I had a very interesting uh, experience with body swap reality when I tried porn VR for the first time. So that was 
years back, and it was one of the main drivers of commercial VR, uh, was uh, pornography and porn uh, having the first VR commercial subscription out there. And the first time I put it on, somebody said, you need to try this. It's very, very disturbing. And I was like, why would porn be disturbing in that sense, right? What do you want to play as? And I was like, I want to play as a man. And I put it on and I felt so much, it's such an intimate moment and I felt so out of, displaced being a man in that context. So on top of having that experience with uh, uh, pornography in front of all people, because it's such a bizarre experience, you're putting like porn in front of your studio, right? And uh, how you're going to react and uh, all that sensation of being exposed. and. Uh, having another body and another experience and another context uh, was very interesting. So I also want to steer this through um, the context of pornography, sex work. I know you have uh, thoughts about that. And then labor and uh, bringing more some things that Etienne has to say about his experience with training labor and uh, how that can shape how we see those things socially. Would you like to get started? No, so it's no, not just me talking all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. So I'll, uh, yeah. So in the context of uh, labor. So I mean, your context is uh, um, Etienne's coming was talking is coming from a background of training programs for labor simula simulators, sort of. But you can say more about that. So that instantly made me think of. Um, well, uh, labor in the context of sex work or VR in the context of sex work, I think it's uh, there's this really interesting ambivalence that uh, on the one hand, as you said, porn is a main driver of technological development and once again a main driver of development of VR. We know that it's a huge market, um, but in that context, it's it's also interesting because porn at the same time is not going to take away from uh, from the need of uh, meat space sex work in that sense. So it's kind of, we can have porn VR experiences and it's a huge market, but it's not going to cut into, it's not going to unemploy, uh, you know, sex workers in that sense, that it's, it's a replacement for that. Um, and at the same time, um, we, at the same time, so if, if you're going to talk about, if, I mean, VR could also be a great way for sex workers to kind of document their reality. Oh no, sorry, I'm I'm getting off track. Other other, I'm mixing two discussions we had. No, the, the other um, the other way in which VR is creating new labor opportunities for sex workers is that it's um, it's kind of lifting webcam. I mean, what we have right now uh, as webcam work, where people work remotely, can be wherever in their own bedroom or apartment, and uh, kind of have have chats with any body uh, in the world um, so through we have the same thing through real time VR that now is kind of opening up um, new ways of revenue or new ways of working for people who are, you know, are performing in avatar and VR are somewhere, can be anywhere on, in, on earth and uh, work with someone, have someone else experience that. But I'm very interested in your perspective about how exactly those two conversations converge, uh, how the means of production and this people of sex workers uh, that might not have the means of production to be protagonism, uh, protagonists of their own storytelling uh, and how that could be a vi viable, how we c like, I was thinking about what you were telling me before of that experience of that sex, uh, sex worker that was uh, uh, shown and distributed without her consent and how the means of production also interfere in who gets to tell the story and who gets to make money out of that story. Yeah. So there was just an example of um, um, at uh, South by Southwest festival where uh, 
a film was shown or a VR piece was shown and the, um, the sex worker, I think her name was Liara Ru, and she partnered up with a producer. Uh, she's uh, she was she's she says she's really interested in VR. She wanted to to create a VR experience with her as a protagonist, but she didn't have the means of production because the equipment is really expensive. So she thought you know she would partner up with this with this guy, and um, then I'm not sure how it really happened, but it all ended up you know, it didn't go well. Let's put it that way. So the the film uh, the final product was shown uh, at south by southwest but without her consent so she didn't really have a say in the end uh, of what the final experience um, would be even though uh, they had they had talked about it beforehand that she would kind of you know have a say and uh, And, and the film then again was pulled off the festival once she spoke up about, you know, I didn't give my consent to this. And I think it's really interesting, yeah, like you said, it's just a good example that shows what, um, what can happen when, you know, obviously the story she was telling, the experience she was telling was only, you know, only she can, can tell that story, but she needed someone else to produce that and that already ended up being a problem. Well, I, I just think it's it's really uh, important to pay attention to how all of the uh, potentials that are supposed to be fixed, um, how they're narrated. So um, we're supposed to, uh, a cis white man is supposed to learn about racism or about misogyny or about these, uh, or we're supposed to have some empathy with a sex worker about means of production, which then in the end repeats that form of exploitation in a, in a different register. And so I, I think it's just really important to, to say that while we can all have a lot of um, uh, hope for empathy, um, that uh, empathy on an individual level doesn't respond to these structural issues in terms of one experience. And so the example that I would like to bring is working in the National Infrastructure Research Lab in Australia, where there was a tremendous thrust to start training laborers uh, through ver VR simulation for heavy extraction industry on the claim that this would reduce their injuries and allow them to be more productive and allow them to kind of be onboarded into this context uh, more efficiently. And what, what ends up happening is that there's a complete isolation of entering into the workforce. And so I think in this question, in the stories we tell, when you get a new job, you hear stories from the people that work there about how your boss is going to fuck with you or how you have to watch your back from this or that other thing. And there's a certain level of, of, of communication that, it, that is a kind of vital aspect of social relations being formed there, which are also political relations, which also relate to structural inequalities. And so one of the concerns that, that I would bring about this is how under claims of empowerment and risk reduction and efficiency, what we actually see in the simulation VR environment around labor is an increasing form of the isolation of the laborer from his or her other laborers. And so how that is going to affect uh, mobilization, labor organization, um, labor rights, which are fundamental to democratic rights, I think it's really important that we pay attention to the atomization of those processes, whether it's in terms of labor in extraction industry or labor in terms of sex work. Exactly. That's why exactly I pointed them out together because they are the most growing revenue in uh, VR and AR right now is both enterprise VR and uh, porn. So uh, that's exactly why I put them together. I find uh, that the structural uh, way that you isolate and that you uh, take away the means of production from the users or the people who should be having uh, certain protagonists over uh, the content creation are being isolated and alienated uh, from being able to tell those stories or to have those uh, very necessary social interactions uh, in the workplace or uh, on the entertainment as well. So that, that's, uh, that was exactly my point. I wanted to know more about things that you saw that you thought was interesting uh why like uh, your bird uh um project was very interesting for me as a game maker. I will totally look more into it. Uh, but 
do we have ideas of how we want to implement our VR practices from now on to create a more stable and a more interesting um, like <laughs> ecosystem or are we still uh, ourselves in awe of uh, the possibilities of uh, what we are doing right now? What's our responsibility, what we can provoke other creators to bring to the table? One, one thing I, I would really be interested to see is how um, we can push certain producers to uh, be a little more vulnerable in terms of the content development and open up to different kinds of narratives and stories that be constructed that aren't their kind of liberal fantasy of helping people find their uh, uh, perfect moment of affect. But um, I think for me, one of the really exciting places is in terms of rehabilitation. And so we're working on a project called the Architecture of the Brain. And one of the key uh, partners is um, the Brain Machine Interface Lab at K KO University. And so um, it's led by Junichi Yoshiba in Tokyo. And so the Brain Machine Interface Lab works on rehabilitation um, for motor cortex damage um, and essentially what they what they help patients to do is to overcome movement disabilities that happen as a result of injuries. But that involves robotics, a number of different software programs, and the interaction between robotics, virtual environments, and retraining the body. But what the Brain Machine Interface Lab has been able to do thus far is to fully rehabilitate to a full range of motion stroke patients, which would have otherwise remained partially immobile for the rest of their life. And, and so the questions that are brought to, to the forefront about neuroplasticity and about learning environments that can really radically retrain the body and, and open up to new possibilities for, for rehabilitation, I think is, is a space that is, is really open to that. Um, and it's just only kind of being explored in some of the more kind of cutting edge labs in Tokyo right now. But um, definitely if you're interested in that relationship of neuroplasticity and virtual space, um, uh, the, the Brain Machine Interface Lab is a really exciting space. That's amazing. That's so cool. I want to learn more about that. You can wear this. You can wear this little. What? On your thing. head? Yeah, and then you can figure out um, all of the ways in which your brain is processing your uh, robotic inputs. And thus, I mean, essentially the point is to teach the brain by hacking it how to utilize channels outside of the motor cortex to coordinate motor functions. It's to rewire. The rewire the brain to tell a different story to itself, and the addition of VR environments as a way of helping understand the robotic feedbacks is a really key element of expediting the, the rehabilitation process. That's amazing, mind blowing. Do you want to ask a question? I feel no, you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you guys have questions? Come on, don't be shy. Oh, Sandra. Wait, he's coming for you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you for, first, first of all, for keeping it real. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, a lot of times we hear about the same kind of questions, but the answers are seldom different. So thank you for that. Especially the conversation, not just about who gets to do VR and who gets to become creators or produce or distribute, but there was a super interesting question asked about um, who are we making this for? And partly we're answering this through a distribution model that comes from other mediums, such as who owns a VR headset. The problem is, so then therefore we're saying, who gets to buy the nice shiny toy, and the nice shiny toy is usually bought by a majority of white men. The thing is distribution models are changing and they're now outreaching also to places like museums, uh, Phi Center in Montreal, uh, movie uh, VR cinemas around the world where anybody else can access. So thinking like you guys did and guiding us through your thought, maybe also the way we talk about who gets to see VR, who we're creating it for, will change when we stop seeing the medium as 
a have or have not a headset at home medium. And as long as we're thinking in have or have not terms, we create that same, we recreate that same inequality system. So I like, you know, the way you're, you're approaching this as saying, who gets to see this VR piece? And that's a question that journalists ask themselves all the time, documentarians as well. Uh, you have to think that that piece might be seen by the exact person that you're talking to. That, that's the first step into rethinking the distribution model itself. So it kind of goes hand in hand. So it's both a comment, but also maybe a question for more. How, how are we pushing new models for distribution? Because right now it's really even the ones financing VR uh, will ask for proof of impact by number of people who got to see it or buy the experience. But for open spaces, the distribution model is different. So any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think that the distribution models are changing all the time. We're, we don't have distribution figured out at all. Um, that's why it's like one of the, when people are talking about like investing in VR, they're like, well, how do we monetize that? And we're still like, oh, wait, because we, we haven't figured out a way. And it's and it, if we're just thinking about headsets, then we're, we're, we really do have like a, a limit on, on who has them at home. Web VR is going to be a big thing. Um, and certainly um, there's quite a few different arcades in Toronto, I think at least four that I can think off the top of my head, where you can just go and experience stuff and then also at the, the theater. Um, and certainly the more, like if you can just access it on your phone um, and then um, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about a greater impact that of course that's limited at the moment. Um, Technically, just like because for, on your phone, you can only, uh, for the most part, experience like 360 rather than really kind of immersive uh, VR. But these are things that are, you know, changing and they're changing pretty quickly. Um, just like two days ago, I think the Oculus Go came out and it's like a, a you know, a relatively affordable headset. Um, and, and so, you know, these are, um, these are things that it, like VR in its current state is not older than five or six years in terms of what we think of it as, as uh, VR now. So um, yeah, those, those uh, distribution models are, are kind of starting to be figured out. Um, anything else? Well, I, I would just maybe add that one of the really interesting things working with the Brain Machine Interface Lab in a number of interviews is that they immediately upon, I mean, this was all hacked hardware. This was completely just from, from scratch. And so immediately there was uh, Sony and Samsung and everyone just at the door trying to say, we'll, we'll patent it and give you $10 million, but we want the patents on the robotics. And they said, absolutely not. If we're going to, if we're going to do this as a, a rehabilitation project, we want it open. And, and, and this is the same conversation we've had about our platforms and people say, yeah, but then how can you survive? And it's like, well, just because it's open, it doesn't mean everyone knows how to build it or turn it on. There's still a lot of potential for affinity work and solidarity work and helping people get systems stood up that I think is underestimated in terms of a model for at least sustaining organizations as an, as an alternative to immediately monetizing the product. I think you have a great point on solidarity. I think uh, many studios, especially uh, small ones, tend uh, to think about their own cash flow and their own uh, necessities in terms of paying their employees first. And I understand that. But I think, uh, like, Pushing more like a community and creating a community, having those conversations can help people push back on those big offers of exclusivity. I think we are in a very good position right now to start pushing back on that. And I also want to challenge uh, Sandra a little bit uh, on Phi Center and the museums and the arcades are not free and are not accessible uh, for many of those people that have been portrayed in those uh, experiences. So one of the things I would like to say is is also democratization of the access of those equipment. As much as I love being able to see them on museums, I think some of the people that are now putting money, I can talk about Canada, but uh, people that are putting money now uh, on them, uh, I just had this discussion last week about uh, putting a VR project that is very artistic and very new out there for free. And we were having this conversation and we are doing it because I think it's time to do a stand and saying, among all the things you can see, 
this is one that is different, and I do not want a price tag to uh, actually make you not experience that, because it's of our interest to make you experience as more variety that you can, right? So I, I think as well, uh, there's public uh, interest that needs to be put in. Uh, there's uh, free arcades that uh, I think one of the ways of making this a very uh, or more viable prices because an arcade to go play a game for one hour is like $25. So of course we are repeating certain power Right? Uh, of course, somebody that just came from Syria to Canada as a refugee is not going to be able to go and pay $12, $25 to be, to be portrayed in a certain way that was not even their uh, initial uh, discourse. And, so, and it's also about just having access to cities and that sort of thing. I mean, to live in Toronto costs like a billion dollars. So it's like, you know, to even be able to be in a city that has um, galleries and, and um, arcades is, you know, a point of privilege. Uh, one of the very cool projects that we've done uh, some years ago were actually with the Cree School Board, uh, that is an uh, uh, indigenous community in Canada, and uh, it was inside the, the school board. So it was like a content on VR being created by uh, indigenous people and for them that was going to be distributed throughout uh, Quebec uh, for kids that were uh, learning how to write and read in Cree. Uh, so that was pretty interesting seeing the, the school board trying to act as a distributor and bringing together with that commission and piece also other pieces to show them what, they, what VR could be and transforming its school in a small arcade. And I thought that was a very interesting model as well uh, for places that do not have an infrastructure of, uh, of museums and arcades and things like that. So thinking about new partners that could be different uh, uh, avenues for showing around VR, that was very weird, Samara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would be very interesting uh, going away from the broadcasters and uh, usual distributors could be an uh, effective way of looking for it. Can I just, um, I'm, I think one of the one of the problems so far this is uh, that we're um, so far we're, we're still sort of lacking the killer application or the killer use you know the the point where vr is going to be so useful to so many people and combined with with technology that's going to be cheap enough that uh, that is just going to you know everybody's going to want to have it so if i think of, i'm really excited about social vr once it, we get to that point because i think that you know my my grandma has installed Skype by now, and I'm sure she would be willing to put on a headset if she she could be in the same room with her family. You know, I think especially for people who are uh, distributed around the globe and and uh, want to be close to friends, close to family, that is going to be a usefulness of we are that is going to bring a lot more people um, and just ex make the the. the circle of people that, you know, are going to have an immediate use of this technology um, expanded a lot. More questions, people? That's it? We're done? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.